All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for another CED Office Hour Live. Of course, I am Crystal Duckett, the Central State Extension Southern Regional Extension Associate. That was a mouthful. And I'm here today with Mrs. Amber Twitty. Of course, as you know, with CED, the goal is to engage in Ohio residents, professionals, and businesses on all things CED. Of course, if you're watching, we always encourage everyone to ask questions and get involved in the chat because there's no CD without C, which is community. And right now it's conversational and we are a community. And so without further ado, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce Mrs. Amber Twitty, who is the CD educator for the Southern Region. How are you, Amber? Hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me again for the third week. I think we got a good batting average now. We're three or three. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my goal today is just to kind of learn about you and all things how how you actually work in CED okay. for extension. So, uh, do you want to just give a small rundown of your background? I have I have at least forty questions to ask off your background alone because it is incredible. But can you just okay. give me the the rundown, please? <laughs> okay, I'll start with a little snippet, and you you know how to you know keep me honest, and if I Go on a tangent, just, just bring me back because, you know, I get excited whenever I talk about community and economic development because it, it is my mission work, not just my job. Um, so I'm blessed to be able to work in something I'm very passionate about. Um, so for me, it's a, as I said, it's not only um, a job, it is my mission work. And that really started just with my upbringing. Um, so a lot of things about community economic development was ingrained when I was younger, didn't know it. It's just things that you were told or taught or shown, and it kind of just, the green light pops on when you get older, and it's like, oh, that's what my grandfather was talking about, right? Now I know why I had to do this and why I did that, and it just comes naturally, right? So uh, with me, specifically with my dad's dad, my grandfather, um, James Twitty, he actually worked in the same department and was one of the first uh, managers in that department um, that dealt with housing revitalization um, for the city of Cincinnati. Now, when he worked, it was in the 60s and 70s, and it was after they built I-75 that went right through the community of West End and, and right through the, the business district of the West End, and a lot of houses were also torn down. And when he um, took over um, the neighborhood revitalization, that's when the city stopped tearing down houses and, and, and took a different approach and said, let's rehab and revitalize neighborhoods, uh, particularly inner city neighborhoods. And so he led that um, beginning stages of revitalizing the inner city neighborhood of West End. West End is a very significant um, neighborhood in the city of Cincinnati. Um, that's where Procter & Gamble, their families, you know, the, the global PNG company, their families lived there. Um, before it was called the West End, uh, it was called Bucktown. And that's where all the African-American families lived as they migrated to the Cincinnati area. So it's a lot of rich history, um, good, bad, and different, but a lot of rich history and Cincinnati history started or is based out of that West End community, uh, which is just adjacent to the core downtown business district, right? and just, and really one block north of City Hall is where West End begins. So flash forward from the 60s and 70s, and my grandfather died in 78. And um, when he was working there, he worked with Senator William Mallory um, Sr. And he worked with Sen uh, um, State Rep William Mallory Sr. And Senator William Bowen, um, who was a state senator, right? And between him working in the city and they working in the different state um, houses, they got a lot of things um, done and accomplished. And they did the grassroots method in the traditional, you know, by the book method, but they also knew how to gravitate and to mobilize communities, individuals. And that's kind of my first taste in the stories, learning from my grandfather. So I learned a lot from Senator Bowen and state rep. Um, Mallory Sr., 
um, when I got older in the 90s, we flash forward to the 90s, and they were telling me about my grandfather, right? And when I joined the department, also people that my grandfather had hired and trained, when they saw my last name, they were like, uh, did you know Jim Twitty? And I was like, yeah, that was my grandfather. So that so that's how I learned how my grandfather worked. So now, now I have a legacy instantly, like, oh, that's a lot of pressure. Like my grandfather did all that because he died, I was seven. Um, so that's kind of my introduction to community and economic development. And then I had awesome mentors. I had Carl Westmoreland Sr., um, as well as Russell Harrison, who taught me all things community and economic development, uh, from the, the advocacy side, the housing, sitting in from the political networks, how decisions are made, all the different departments and um, players that make things go around, things that are planned 20 years ahead of time before they actually implement it, how to watch out for that, and the importance of our role as professionals to be able to, to recognize all of that and how we can how our jobs in themselves impact um, projects and neighborhoods for generations to come. So for an example, um, working with businesses and government was something that was ingrained. So for example, in um, downtown over the Rhine, and I'll talk a lot about Cincinnati because that's where I'm from, that's where I'm based in Cincinnati, and that's where I, I begun my career. And in the early 90s, we worked with a group of businesses in a two block area of downtown um, neighborhood called Over the Rhine, now it's dubbed as OTR. And they fixed up their buildings. They were mixed use buildings, storefronts on the bottom, housing on the upper two floors. And in exchange for fixing up their buildings within a year, renting them out, they got grant money, their, their loan turned to, to grant money. And to this day, that spurred the redevelopment of that um, two block area. And to this day, 30 years later, it's still the home of many um, mom and pop businesses. It's an entertainment district, it's very vibrant, and it's a critical part of the local economy of the Over the Rhine neighborhood to this day. People come from all over. Um, it is strategically near you know, the, the, the Aronoff Art Center, the riverfront area. Um, so they come there after those meals, those plays to continue um, the entertainment and support local businesses. There's art galleries, clubs, restaurants, a little bit of everything there. So looking back in now, you know, and we're in 2020, and that project used to be, you know, dilapidated housing, it was run down, it was drug activity, everything going on through there. And to see 30 years later, that small project where we worked with the owners and gave them incentives to fix up the properties and to maintain them, is still bringing in income. And it's a vibrant area of the community that everyone benefits from 30 years later. So that's an example of the city working, you know, with with businesses, but our role as CED professionals having lasting impact on everything that we touch. Well, thank you, Amber. That man. You I don't think I'm going to the next story, but I'm going to call. <laughs> no, because I, I, I guess we're just going to keep it conversational today because I, I have so many questions. So one of the questions that I want to ask is can you give a little bit more information in regards to like Cincinnati? I know you've talked about how it's changed over the years, but we're going to fast forward till 2022. And we're talking about just all things CED, but it also want to tie it into agriculture and how there are certain neighborhoods in the city of Cincinnati that are experiencing food deserts. Can you share any good news that might be happening in the Cincinnati oh. area? Yes. In regards to those oh, food oh, deserts? Um. Earlier this year on our CED Office Hour Live program, we had um, Pastor Damon Lynch III, and he had talked about um, some of the good works that New Prospect Baptist Church, which is one of the major churches and is also commonly known as the Well because they do so many, um, they do a lot of CED work actually, 
in the Cincinnati community, and they've partnered with a community development corporation, and they'll be opening a grocery store, eliminating a food desert that has been in existence for over 10 years in the Roseline and Bond Hill communities. Um, they had the ribbon cutting ceremony a couple days ago, and um, they will, it'll be a local owned businesses, so they'll be doing job creation. They will be sourcing a lot of their um, uh, products and services from local and minority owned businesses. So they are creating a, a new economy and produce and product streams um, that will be locally sourced. Okay. So I'm very excited. I am too. I like to say I'm a Cincinnati transplant. I'm not there yet, but you know. Yes. It's, I keep it's gonna be. I'll be there soon. Come on down to Cincinnati. I'm telling you, I'm on the way. I I am on. As soon as I find some place, you, I will be right there. I promise. You won't be able to get rid of me because listen, Cincinnati is a very. When I first heard about it, um, just the area, and I, w I was actually able to go out like the Pendleton night out and to meet with so many individuals in the community and understand the true historical aspect of Cincinnati. Yes. It's, it's huge. And I see why you have such a love for Cincinnati when it comes to work. And it, it really did start in the family because you have such a, a heart of service, but then you also have the blood of service. So I kind of want to segue into asking you somewhat of a, like a position requirement. Okay for just somebody who might be interested in CED, can you talk about maybe some of the soft skills that a person would need to have in order to do well in community economic development? If like someone's listening and they're thinking, man, CED is exciting. It's lots of little pockets that I could work in, but what skills do you think they would need to have, soft skills or even hard skills that they may need to have? First of all, you need to be able to listen. Okay. And actively listen. Okay. Uh -huh. You can't come in being a dictator and saying, this is what I'm going to do for you. You come in and say, hey, here are some of the things that I've done that hopefully you see that of value. But if not, let's find out how I can be of a help to whatever that community or individual needs for that community or project. Um, you have to have vision. You have to think of like when you go in a house that needs to be rehabbed, and people say, oh, I, this house is ugly because, you know, it's not painted. The, the cabinets are falling off. But you have to have vision to see if those cabinets are done and how can those cabinets get done and who do I need to network with. So it's a lot of relationship management. Um, people will have different agendas. Um, but what I found that a lot of times people have they, they have the same end goal in mind, but they have different paths on how they want to get there. So we become translators um, in, 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 in building common ground. So we have to kind of listen once again and, and manage those relationships and determine what the real goals are, the common ground and build common ground. And, and, and that's how you get projects done and you get buy-in and it benefits the people that it's intended to serve. So the key thing is listening, relationship management. Um, as far as hard skills, um, it's really, community economic development is so interdisciplinary. It touches on everything. So whatever you're interested in, there is a space in CED for you. And so it's really, based on what your interest and skill set is in, and then you can determine the hard skills that you want to apply to CED. Perfect. Eric, you got something to say? I saw you unmute it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, wait, I just wonder, you know, I just want to commend uh, Amber, right? So. It can go a lot of different directions, but you've got some really specific hard skills, <laughs> like the knowledge about infrastructure projects, right? So how does a community work on its physical, like the physical side of who it is, <laughs> as yes. well as uh, the over the Rhine story and that, uh, 
how do you work with the, the business community and create an ecosystem that supports them? So those are a couple, couple of the hard skills that I think you bring to this that I just really, really think are remarkable. Well, thank you. And speaking of that project, part of the hard skills too was developing, organizing the owners so that they built community among each other, right? And um, as the new businesses came in, so we formed, um, they call it Merchants on Main Street, Moms. And that was their kind of small business district, um, neighborhood business district association. And that's how they communicated. They did kind of like a co-op format where they uh, marketed the area and said, hey, come and and and, and um, support our businesses. And, and that's how they started. And that's before you had internet and things. So they, they did flyers. Um, they did what I call meeting on all the news stations and did small interviews um, to get the word out. And then those businesses had gallery openings. So you, you had all kinds of things going on. So they had activities going on. And so that's how it started. And they've maintained that through that neighborhood business district relationship that they um, incorporated. Now it's a whole over the Rhine neighborhood business district but that's how kind of how it started and so i was happy to be a part of helping them get that structure together because i'm not there anymore but it's still sustaining and that's part of our our job is to put things in that can sustain and we're kind of like train a trainer so i worked myself out of that project right out of that area and that's the goal is so that now it's for the community to maintain it um, another thing with infrastructure is another example is the Portsmouth Bypass Project, and that was a highway that connected State Route 23 to State Route 50. It's about a 26 mile highway that was created from scratch. It was just completed in 2019, um, and it's in the greater Portsmouth area. It's now known as the Veterans Memorial Highway, and that completed the Appalachian highway system in Ohio, portion that's in Ohio. Um, physically, what that did was it reduced commute times in the area by over a half an hour. It increased, well, decreased the emergency response times in the area because of the highway being there. So instead of them having to go around a big hill or mountain, they can go right up the highway and they had cut through. So that increased the emergency response times. Um, well, decrease emergency response time, so better services. Um, and then another thing is when you build highways like that or infrastructure, you have exit ramps. And what's the first thing that happens at an exit ramp? You have a gas station pop up, a convenience store. And then, you know, it's really popping when you see a McDonald's, <laughs> you know, then you see a family dollar and you see a, a local mom and pop pizza place, you know, and it starts growing. So now it, it spurs economic development. Um, so that's what I like about the infrastructure piece. When you get to work on that and it, it sets things up to develop an area and bring business in, in a local economy, makes it stronger. I, you know, I, I just wanted to uh, comment on, um, I mean, we always learn a lot uh, when, when Amber goes over the history <laughs> um, and, um, and, and, you know, and with your family being uh, multi-generational in the, the, that, that sort of line of service um, as, um, as uh, Crystal made reference to. Um, one thing that, that stood out to me as you were talking about um, observing and learning how planning uh, is done at you know like 20 year leaps of time that they're planning on and um and 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 with your background and with your family being involved in 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 that space um mm -hmm. for that period of time you, you sort you've seen some things and, and what have you um one of the things that stands out to me is how there's with, within our communities, um, and I'm talking about community general, like like the state, you know, what have you, that mm -hmm. this long term planning. It, it, it does occur. Um, but we there are folks, you know, such as the, the black community and others that have. 
immediate um, needs. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they are experiencing, um, you know, immediate harm and, 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 and pain. So this long-term planning, um, you really have no choice but to survive, you know, you know during that period. But um, I, I think that one thing we're hearing nowadays is a lot of young folks saying that they don't want to, be, they're tired of waiting. The way that you all did it before, you know, uh, didn't work and that kind of thing. There has been some progress, but the youth are disenchanted with how things are. Um, so do you have any um, thoughts or have you sort of um, thought about, you know, how, you know, like how do we connect with um, or is it the, the, the place of CED to connect with young folks, um, be they teens, be they young adults, and help them navigate and position within this uh, this, this kind of work? So you set it up for me to get a definition of CED, as I always do, right? Community economic development is looking at the whole system. So on one end is the infrastructure, kind of things that we just talked about. The opposite end is the people development, right? So that's youth employment, preparing for future leaders, working with veterans, workforce development, personal professional development, right? Um, quality of life things. The connector are the organizations that service all of those kind of things, businesses um, that connect the infrastructure with the people. So that's how we build the whole community. And that's how we live, work, and play, right? So CED professionals, mm -hmm. we touch on all of that. So that's why I said your hard skills can be anything. You can be mm -hmm. anything from an engineer to a social worker and anything in, in between. Um, entrepreneurship. Um, in today's society, when you look at TikTok, you look at um, Instagram, everything is in commercials. Everything is a short picture, short movie. Twitter is a short little statement, right? And so now we're in this generation, they have grown up. That's all they've seen, right? Whereas we've kind of seen the whole transition. That's all they know. So that's how they think. So we can't use a model from 20 years ago because that doesn't work. That doesn't apply to the youth of today. So one way that we need to do is we need to learn from youth, right? We need to engage youth and youth are going to be taking care of us. Youth are going to be running businesses. Um, out of this pandemic, you have a whole lot of youth showing their entrepreneur spirit. I think it's beautiful. Um, now, do they need some wisdom? Yes. We can provide that, but we have to be more about the wisdom piece more so than the how to. The innovation is the how to. They are the, they are the innovation, right? We are the wisdom. We might give you a little history. Here are some things to think about, right? But we're not dictating. Once again, we're listening and a little knowledge, dropping little drops of wisdom, things like that. And they come up with a lot of great solutions. Um, so youth employment programming, right? Um, I've worked a lot in that space, like over 20 years. And I focused more when I ran those kind of programs on their personal brand, how they carry themselves, their soft skills, um, how they communicate being aware of how others communicate, um, really career pathing, exploring what you're interested in, right? And using the program, if you don't like it, okay, it's okay. Try something else next summer, right? This is the chance to explore. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I held the work sites accountable. Don't just have them as free labor. Teach them your business, that they're here, they're here to learn. Um, if you are an entrepreneur, teach them the entrepreneur, the business side of it. Don't just have them watching the kids at the daycare. Teach them how to do the processing so that they can see how you get paid. If they're interested in being a teacher, have them do a lesson plan. Teach them how to do that and to plan and to work with kids so they can see that this is if this is something they really want to do a pursuit. And so I treated those summer youth employment programs as internships. So to me, it's our responsibility to provide that environment for them to learn, 
um, to explore and to excel. Through extension, we all know everybody's got to eat. Agriculture is not going anywhere, right? Now, how it looks may, may be different, right? There's different processes, different technologies, but that's something that everybody, you know, back in the day, you had a vocational trade and you had education. So even if you had a PhD, you might know how to change the oil, right? You knew something vocationally how to do as a side hustle. So we need to teach our kids. I think I think everyone needs to learn agriculture. And I think we can use our platform to, to promote that and teach them the, the ways to be an entrepreneur within that space, because it's just something that is not taught, it's not talked about. And so this is something new and innovative, even though it's been around, but we're, we're, we're teaching it to a new audience. So I think that's how some of the ways that we can engage, um, especially with the entrepreneurship piece. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you, Amber. I um, I personally agree with you, I think, with the, the change of technology and, you know, watching my siblings growing up and looking at the dif difference in attention spans because of how technology has really evolved. It's turned a lot of us into, I don't want to say a lot of us, but it's turned things into a you know, I had to go and get library books from the library with the Dewey Decimal System, right? Like you had to know your Dewey Decimal System. So now we, I'm telling on my age, right? Um, and then now it's like, okay, the libraries are struggling to stay alive and holding more programs in their locations before where it was just a complete silent zone because they want to get the youth engaged because there's, you know, Wikipedia, there's social media, and you don't have to do so much work to find information. It's information overload, right? Yeah, so, you can stuff and don't even spell it right, and it's still going to come up for you. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. You're right. And so just meet, like you said, meeting the ch the children and the, the, the youth, I should say, where they are is, is definitely important on building relationships. Right? Like you said, you can't come in like a dictator. And, uh, and tell the community what they're going to get. Now, I have another question okay. that I think you'd enjoy. What are some of the projects that you've worked on that you are most proud of? Ooh. Over the years, I would say the youth employment, because watching a child, a young person, transform in eight weeks over the summer is amazing. And watching mm -hmm. them come back the next summer and grow even more especially the 14 and 15 year olds, because a lot of people say, oh, can't deal with them, right? But the 14 and 15 year olds are like sponges because this is their first job, really their first sense of independence with their money that they earn themselves. Um, sometimes the 16 and 17 year olds, you got you to gotta have a special, you know, sometimes they, they've lived a little bit more life, right? So you got to have a little bit more patience sometimes. Um, but the young people are just sponges up and they they want to learn. They are just such leaders to me. Um, and if you really talk to them and listen, once again, that keyword, listen, you will learn so much. And they will come up with some very innovative solutions to things that they see as problems. So it's up to us to facilitate that. So that's one of the things that I'm proud of. Um, is being able to work in that space. Um, another project is working with veterans. Um, I had a project where we I had a colleague and we went down to Fort Benning down in Columbus, Georgia, and got them into the expedite with FedEx. And because they drove heavy equipment in the service, they didn't have to go through CDL training. They just had their commanding officer to sign off on it. They went and got their license. They had their CDL designation. They already had full, um, because they were honorably discharged, they had the highest level of, of security clearance and they could go right to FedEx, do the three day training and then be driving a truck. So they immediately um, were working within a couple of weeks after being discharged, working full time, coming out, making at that time, 60 to $80,000 a year, um, providing for their families. Um, by them already being gone away, 
large, long periods of time anyway. They were already used to that. Their families were used to that. So being over the road, custom critical, which was the top paying level mm -hmm. for FedEx, that really wasn't an adjustment being away. So culturally, so um, they were very successful at that. Um, learned that it was a lot of extra support she had to give like socially um, with them adjusting back into society, but was glad that we were able to provide that employment opportunity. And then some of them, we also, they became their independent drivers. Um, with extension specifically, well, now let me go back to Portsmouth Bypass Project. With that, that was a public, it's called a public-private partnership. So that meant that the private developers had taken on some of the risk. They paid for part of the project. So it saved taxpayers money because instead of just having um, taking 20 years to build that 26 mile highway. They did it in four. Um, so it didn't have to go through several administrations and, and several budget approvals. Um, and in exchange for uh, building it on time and within budget, the developer and, and the construction company got a maintenance agreement to 30 year maintenance agreement. So they're still getting paid off of that project long after they, they finished building it. Um, but the benefit to the taxpayers is that it costs less. Um, it was less risk on the taxpayers and the taxpayers got to fully utilize and use the project um, in four years versus 20 years out. So that is an example of a good public private partnership. Those are called P3 type projects. And that was the first of its kind um, in the state of Ohio is used a lot um, on a lot of um, uh, transportation um, projects. Um, but within Central State, since I've been in Central State, um, like I said, I'm new to agriculture. Um, I've, I've been here a year and a half, um, not new to CED, obviously. And for me, it's been more fruitful just to learn a new industry. But along the way, um, working with Eric and Ambrose and Paige and Ashley and Steve and Anthony when they were here, um, just working with them, working with you all um, has always been a pleasure. And we save the world probably every other week. <laughs> we always are solving some kind of problem and getting to, to create programming that, that is meaningful for the community in response to businesses in the community has been um, has been more beneficial for me. And because of that, you know, I am in the middle of creating what's called the Entree to Entrepreneurship Program, and it's exploring the entrepreneurship option for those who have some type of criminal background. And we will be um, teaching it um, prior to people being released from prisons or local jails, as well as those who have already um, gotten out of jail or they just have a record and never gone to jail. But what's so innovative about that is that traditionally when you have a record, it becomes transactional that you just get a job because that meets your probation requirements, right? That's It, it wasn't about, is this my passion um, or anything? It was, you just need to get a job. And a lot of times they were entry level jobs it wasn't thought like, how can I grow from that job? It wasn't career pathing, it was just a job. Um, so it's very transactional. So you had a lot of turnover. Um, people were unhappy, morale's down. Um, so one of the things that, that just talking with agencies that service the reentry population, um, as well as individuals who are part of the reentry population, um, it was like, but I'm, I didn't know that entrepreneurship was an option. I was like, oh, yes, the state has changed its laws beginning in 2012 to make entrepreneurship more viable and there's a lot more opportunity. So to give you an example, my dad is, was um, the first African-American police chief for the city of Cincinnati, assistant chief. And one of my brothers decided he wants to be into street pharmaceuticals. 
in my daddy's district. And of course, he gets picked up by somebody in the district while he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And, you know, then he wants daddy to pick him up at work. That wasn't happening. My daddy didn't play that. So he goes to jail. Now he has a record, right? So a few years after that, he decides he wants to try to get himself together and goes back to school. Very bright. Goes to school for real estate. Real estate has nothing to do with his street pharmaceuticals that he was doing. He gets a year in. And when it goes time to go to the state to get his real estate license approved to be able to apply, they told him no because he has a record. Now, flash forward to 2012, the state said, hmm, if your offense isn't aligned with the career, let's change that. They still should be able to do it. So now if he had did armed robbery, no, he shouldn't be a real estate agent if he armed robbery in someone's house, right? That makes sense. But that doesn't mean that he couldn't, if he had did that, that he couldn't be a barber. Mm -hmm or cosmetologists or, you know, some other license type of, of work. So um, the laws in Ohio have been, been uh, adjusted greatly um, for that. So that gives you more opportunities. So what we're doing is, like I said, creating a program where it gives them a chance to explore that. Um, Ambrose created the four page uh, business plan, which is a very detailed concept paper. It makes them do some research on the industry, what they want to do, how they want to do it, the why. Um, so I incorporated that in the program. We also will be doing some leadership development as well as emotional intelligence and diversity. And they might get through the program and say, this was a good exercise, but I'm not ready right now. Or entrepreneurship is more to it than I thought. So I think I'm just going to go to work, right? But because we have that personal development, that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, other um, offenders who are, are entrepreneurs, um, they have the opportunity now to do career mm -hmm. pathing, right? Um, they have some skill sets, some soft skills to be a um, manager or supervisor or eventually a C-suite professional. So, and, and so our programming is looking at those soft skills. So everybody gets something tangible out of that, whether they choose to be an entrepreneur or not. And then if they choose to be an entrepreneur when they finish the program, then they would roll into our Ready, Set, Grow, which is working whether you're an entrepreneur, existing business, um, or, you know, whatever level you are within the entrepreneurship space with your business and, and giving you some tools and resources so that you can grow your business to the next level. And so that ends up being a feeder um, program for our Ready, Set, Grow. So I'm proud of that. Um, I'm proud of our Ready, Set, Grow. We have a special um, track within that called Ready, Set, Grow Agriculture. And like I said, we're always creating new programs and there was a need within Extension. We have a beginning farmer program and the agriculture team came to us and said, we need this business training for our beginning farmer. So we said, OK, and we over four months of programming just on our aspects of businesses. We just finished it in March and we are still working with the beginning farmers. There's a group of them that are in that in those classes that are forming their own co-ops. There are some other ones who will be having multifaceted farms, meaning they're not gonna be just growing, but they're also gonna be doing some other programming. So they're diversifying their income base for their farm to be viable, um, like a social enterprise because they have other aspirations to impact um, their communities. So we are like a springboard um, and those are things I'm proud of is, is that impact once again. I'll pause. Because <laughs> I, I was getting ready to get on a roll again. <laughs> you know, I was reading an article the other day uh, about entrepreneurship. Yeah. Someone, who, someone who's within a company but has that entrepreneurial mindset, right? And that <laughs> speaks to what you're talking about. Yes. I think that's a 
It's an interesting idea. But that's really what we do. If you think about it. Yep. Entrep yeah, I think that's Entrep like cut across the... Think of things to improve a process or they come up with something totally new, right? And what do we do? We improve processes. People say, hey, this is what we need. OK, we'll create something or we improve something that was done or we think of another way to do it. And because we have such vast backgrounds in different areas of CED, we pull upon all those different experiences and we come up with a new way to engage. That's how this program was created. We were sitting around like, how can we engage people differently? Um, we know that even if the pandemic went totally away today, People are used to being online. We're a small but mighty group. We're still mighty, but we want to make sure that we effectively communicate to the whole state. So this is one avenue through CED Office Hour Live that we do that. Right. Well, well, and 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 also um, just I guess that we can add add it to the mix here. Um, part of that development of the CED Office Hour Live was to. Uh, like over time, give folks also some insight into just, you know, what we talk about and how we discuss things and um, give them an opportunity to also interact, you know, to, yeah. to ask questions, to uh, provide their um, uh, perspectives, you know, into that as well, which also helps us as we continue to do our work. So um, I, I, I do think that um, we are, we, we did hit on something and and um, and as more and more folks get to see us and get to see this program, um, I can I can see it being of being of uh, you know benefit. And then I have one more program that that's kind of been taken off lately um, that we're doing it, and that is our our record silly clinics. And I'm passionate about that um, because it impacts people immediately. Like once they get to record silly clinics. Um, record sealed, they don't have to talk about <laughs> their past incidents or whatever happened, experience or whatever. They can legally say, no, I, I didn't have, I didn't, nothing, you know, I have nothing to report, right? Nothing happened. They don't have to talk about that. And it immediately opens up additional opportunities um, for in the areas of education, jobs, and um and housing so um that's one of the things that i'm very proud that we are finally able to um really get off the ground and we're currently planning clinics in like 10 different counties so this fall we're going to be very busy <laughs> um in addition to the county we're already working in so i am very excited about about that and in the planning of that, we're working with so many different stakeholders in the in the community. So they're really the owners. I always tell them we're just helping to convene and 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 coordinate. Because they say, well, what date do you want? I said the date that you want to have it is the date we're going to do it. So I always put it right back on them. <laughs> I think another thing that we did uh, in the region that was pretty awesome is I don't want to use the word upselling, but we really when Amber is such as as much as Amber as well, I don't want to say it like you're not here as much as you can explain and talk so passionately you do have active listening skills so we were meeting with some individuals and some of the stakeholders talking about the record healing clinics and we were able to listen to their need and say hey let's see if they're interested in the CQE or if they're interested in some other programs especially those that will help the businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Feel comfortable with hiring. So you made it seamless because it's like, all right, now that's also partnering, right? These individuals whose records got sealed with companies that are willing. Now they know, look, I have a list of people in my area, in my community that are actually excited and willing to work with me. And so that gives them hope. And, and that's a, a foreseeable future for them to not, like you said, just get a check in a box and say, hey, I found a job. I may not even may not even like it, but I have to get employment. CD, I see how in real time that really truly 
benefits individuals and impacts their lives. So I think that is absolutely incredible. So like I said, I'm Team CD. For sure. Welcome, James. Hey, hey, you team CED, what happened to FCS? Hey, um, but Amber, hey, thank you for the information. And hey, I just, I, gu I guess my questions, question would be with, I think Amber just, Chris has mentioned it. So your programs are designed to help individuals get from where they are, bridge the gap to get to where they want to go. And from, I'm trying to relate. So from an FCS standpoint, I have people call it diabetes. They have diabetes, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of programs out there to help people with diabetes, from the doctors to nurses to education. With your programs, are you seeing what you are offering? It's not as available. Therefore, the success rate and engagement rate is a lot better for you than like for me in that regards, because of so many resources available from my end mm -mm. it's about no. relationships okay. relationships it's about relationships because when you have strong relationships you? people will call you they they will want you to, you're you become their go-to so even if you can't help them they know that you can connect so with cd we also connect so think about um james with sensi um stem lab right I knew about that service and I knew about how you wanted to do some nutritional cooking kind of things. That has nothing to do with the work that I'm doing, but I knew that that was a good fit for some of your FCS work. So I took that relationship because I had a strong relationship with them and connected you to them and said, hey, make sure you all connect. And now you are in path, you're gonna be doing some programming with them. So it's really about relationships. And once you build those relationships, you almost have more of a word of mouth um, kind of connection. Now, the flyers and things like that, that's more documentation. But the real, the get people to actually come, that's the relationship. That's the stakeholder outreach. So with Portsmouth area, where we're going to be doing three or four record selling clinics, for instance, we started out meeting with two people. I guess Crystal and I passed their litmus test and they said, hey, they're authentic. They really want to do the work. Um, they connected us to two or three other people who said, hey, we want you to come to this meeting. So now there's a whole community of stakeholders that we're working with and we're going to be planning out activities for the next year just on record selling clinics. But also what Crystal mentioned, there was a, a, a problem and I came up with a solution. So now we're planning that too, that we'll be doing some um, programming around that. So the main thing is really just relationships. Right on, thank you for sharing that. And I would would piggyback on that because now I think about it, I'm, I'm doing a health fair on Saturday due to a relationship that I established at one of my programs. So that's a great call. I knew the answer to that. I was just wanting to hear you say it, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, that's, and you look very nice today, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you always look nice. Don't let me say that. But you put on some lipstick today or something. You, 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 yeah, I want to match girl. the background. You see, I got on yeah. my, my, my CSU yeah. gold. Yeah. And so I had yeah. to put on my CSU burgundy, you know, to go with the background. I had to be coordinated. Yes, ma'am. I got you. I got you. Yeah, that, that, that attention to detail. Uh, <laughs> I, I know that Eric had his hand up. I, I just wanted to jump in real quick. When you talk about relationships, um, there's also, um, uh, you know, uh, in responding to a James question, it, it, it's also the authenticity and the skills of those individuals who are delivering that, 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 that information, that education, that knowledge, what have you. Um, because you can have one topic, but you can have 12 different people and not all of them are going to deliver it the same. Um, yes. And, and our team, um, when, when especially when folks are in their their zone and in their 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 space, um, uh, I think we have a very strong team. So our thing really is just getting in front of more of our Ohio residents. But um, we have some 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 things to 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 help and some people to actually deliver it. Um, it I think and, it's and we always stay authentic, right? 
we know our stuff, but we always stay intentionally authentic. Um, and if we don't know something, we say we'll find out and then we go find out and make that connection or give them the information. So we we don't just push people off or just give them any kind of answer. Um, so I think that that helps to build the relationships as well. Yes. Yeah. Thank you both for saying that. Yeah. Cool. Yes, Eric. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I guess part of what I love about CD is, I mean, here I am. I'm outside of uh, St. James Missionary Baptist Church. <laughs> um, and uh, yesterday, last night I was uh, in Toledo. Uh, with some small business folks here. I'm working with a civic entrepreneur that they want to start a neighborhood association, right? Toledo with the small business, so the small business community in a, a historic inner invested neighborhood. I mean, so the diversity is really, a, but I think that, so that's that's fun in our space. Yes. <laughs> and, and I guess, um, but in every situation where we bring that skill set of being able to connect the dots, right? And so I guess I'm wondering though, to James's point, yeah, we don't teach diabetes prevention or the health programming that he mentioned. So, but what would you say if somebody came to you and said, hey, I want to make a change around this social issue? What would you, how would you then take your, take that mindset, the paradigm, the training that you've had? How would you, I mean, what would you do with that? Well, first of all, I would ask them exactly what did they envision that looking like, right? Um Tell me more, as you as you always say, Eric. Well, tell me more, and and then determine. Okay, well, based on that, I'll say that's in my lane. Is not, but I know someone who can help, and I will pitch it over to James really quick, <laughs> and say, let me connect you to James. I will tell him how I'm going to connect him, and then I will call James. James, I'm I'm sending you an email. This is the situation. This is their needs, right? And then I say, let me know when you all connect. <laughs> um, I will follow up with that person maybe in a, in a week or a couple of days to a week and say, make sure that their needs were met, the connection was made, and if there's anything else. So it's really you become a customer service kind of person. Um, and it's almost like you're just a facilitator, that coach, just to make sure that they made the connections. And just following up to make sure this, if there's anything else that they need help with. So to this day, because of doing that, I get calls from a lot of people asking. I'm like, I don't know how did I my name. You know, I'm in my I'm like, how did you get my name? I don't, I've never worked over in that area, but I know somebody who did. So I I connect them, and that's one of the things the beauty of the of the CD work because. We do so many different things and we're in so many different spaces. It's usually someone that we know or we know a friend of a friend, right? <laughs> they can get them to where they need to be. So we're a connector, we're a translator, um, coach, facilitator. We wear a lot of different hats, but that's how I would approach it. And 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 I would uh, add to that, um, Eric, and also just the idea that that we will um, like like my my approach. I would also probably learn like research that that area and and do a quick study and you know sort of come up to speed a little bit on it. Uh, one of the things that we address, I think, within CED is all is also just the um, the use case. I mean, before we can really refer someone, we have to have some base understanding of what this thing or situation is that this person is 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 trying to do and then that i think that will inform our connection or referral to someone else and you know and we might even sort of get into it a little bit more ourselves so um um so yeah so i, I you know I, I just think that among our team though we have a you know i think a, a wide range of um expertise interests ability to dig into other topics and then that network for referrals um and that's just with you know within the uh the three-person team that we have at the, at the present 
Um, but you know that you know hopefully will be growing here soon as they uh, bring in more more staff. And it seems like sometimes you're paying attention to the energy, right? So if, if it's not just James saying, "Hey, diabetes," if it's ten people that have pushed you about diabetes, whatever it is, then you know there's something there. There's a there there, right? So you mm -hmm. dig into it, like you said, then you find out there's a holistic. So you know there's a holistic approach that needs to happen, here, right? And so, okay. Part of the problem is the access. Part of the problem is to to the information, but part of the problem is our structures, our systems aren't set up for, you know, healthy whatever. And so we start to work on those systems as well. So I just appreciate that. I still think we're going to have to do some uh, to help these young folks though, because they're gonna <laughs> they they are they are restless um, and and oh, they have I good told, reason, I but they have good agree. reason to be. There, there's good reason to be. Because the, I, I took some notes as you were uh, talking earlier in your uh, presentation, Amber, and I and I the, the word long suffering came to mind, and and so I did a quick little search on. I mean, we read it all the time, or or, or have read it over the years, and it is you know sort of that um, um, dealing with over a, over an extended period of time the the hard hardships or harshness or maybe un, you know uh, unjust treatment. Um, that someone is getting from someone else. And I can see, especially as as with technology, how information flows so quickly, young folks, people get to know more of what's going on at a quicker and deeper level. And the frustration then, like, wait a minute, how long has this been going on? <laughs> and um, it just hits. and or or how often is this happening? whatever the 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 uh, uh, issue may be. So, I think there is an opportunity, there's a need, and I think there's an opportunity within cooperative extension service, our system, um, for there to be some um, quick uh, response and, 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 and tapping into those young folks, because um, uh, we're, we're in some, a, a space that the world, you know, our country and the world really hasn't been in um, before, at least with this level of information flow. So, yeah. Um, I think the beauty of extension is that it is the end users has more voice than they think. Um, and if they demand this is what I want, that pushes extension to move faster. And I think in our role as CD professionals, um, we have an opportunity to kind of build talent pools of individuals, right? So we can provide that platform um, like a think tank of uh, innovation of the of, of the youth to say, okay, this is something you're not unhappy with. We can take them through that business canvas process, right? And say, okay, how are you going to solve it? Right? Exactly. Now that you came up with a solution, now we come a coach or facilitator on how to implement it. Mm -hmm. Yep. But they are the lead because it's their they came up with the solution. So so we're kind of pushing them to not only think about the problem, but how do you solve it? Right, right. And, and encourage and them to solve it. Give them the platform to mm -hmm. to move in that direction. Right. And that's where some of that education of the of, of the process of make that demand upon extension uh, of just educating people about that, you know, the community make and, and the reason for make that demand upon us and, you know, and then we can help navigate that through the system to then provide, you know, like, like what you just described back. So, yeah, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. So to give you a quick example, I know we're coming up on our time. Um, when I was working in Cincinnati Public Schools and I was a diversity and, and inclusion um, consultant and they were redoing the schools and one of the schools, which it happens to be my alma mater, Wana Hills High School is the most diverse high school in the state, right? And they were doing major construction where the kids wanted to make sure the students had approached our team and said, we want to make sure that the construction, the people, the businesses working on our school 
are reflective of the population of our school, meaning they wanted a diverse population. They didn't want it one sided versus the other. They wanted a diverse. How can we impact that? Because we can't vote, right? Because we're all under age. So our team sat down with them to your point and said, okay, let's work through this problem. And they came up with the implementation plan. They ended up holding a um, press release conference, press conference that was well attended. They came up with ways to monitor. They met with our team and the construction team um, throughout the whole process to check the numbers. So I, this is how you monitor contract progress and things like that. So they learned something. And then I taught them how to incorporate that experience in their college applications, right? In their portfolios, because a lot of them were juniors and seniors at the time. So that was a way of them showing how to advocate and have a voice, even when you can't vote. And they were successful. That whole project remained a very diverse project and one of the highest diversity rates out of the 65 schools that were done. I, I think um, maybe uh, witnessing sort of the birth of a uh, another uh, uh, program within CED here, um, because one of the things I, I share one of the pictures or a couple of slides when I give those presentations when um, during the um, uh, 2020 when things were happening um, um, with the social unrest and all. Um, there was a, a group in Columbus that asked me to come down um, with high school students and talk with them about uh, what are their rights in terms of doing protests and things of that nature. And, and, and I shared information with them in terms of, you know, the, the, some of the constitutional rights, First Amendment, those kinds of things. So to the point in, in the program that you're saying, I have the feeling maybe we need to um, explore that kind of uh, uh, offering as well that we can make available to our communities because, um, I have a feeling there's going to be some things happening in the next That's few months. That's all part of community resiliency. Exactly. Eric. <laughs> For those who don't know, Eric is the lead on community resiliency work. The communities, communities are. We're, we're support. Yes. What did you say before, Eric? Or was it Ambrose? Those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. So the community, I have one quick question, uh, one last thing. I know we're over our time, but you know, we it starts getting good and then we start getting to our conversations. But um, in regards to the community, and I think you mentioned this Ambrose, just us having to work with the, the youth. Lots of times when it comes to like struggles and how you were mentioning that the, uh, the youth is growing restless. It's usually because we watched our parents and heard their struggles and then their parents and their parents. Then there are, you know, the city hall meetings that they will go to or the local meetings in their community and they don't get any answer. How can CD set itself aside because we want the community to come and, like you said, tell us the problems that you're facing so that we can do our best to create solutions for them or help you create solutions. What do you think is a way for CED to set itself aside for maybe a city hall or a count, city council meeting to where the community can know, hey, we actually do drive results if they've never heard of us before? Well, the good thing about government is that there's always in the, in the council meetings, commissioner meetings, they always have a public where you can just sign up to speak and we can use that platform to just give general presentations on what we're doing. We can use like we will be starting um, later this year a, a um, newsletter so we can start making sure that those different um, um, uh, officials get copies of the newsletters so they're starting to get information about what we do on a regular basis um, inviting them to people to our CD office hour live and also just asking the people we serve like hey let other people know how we've helped you so you have that word of mouth you have the formal 
ways of communicating and using the different social media platforms to get the word out. You need to systematically say, okay, I'm going to start at this county or this city or this municipality, this meeting, and then you just systematically work your way out that way. I think part of it also. Add, oh, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. Well, just to add, uh, you know, something that a, a community development professional brings to any scenario, scenario is an understanding of group process and process generally. And so I think, you know, the question becomes, OK, so if you want to uh, if you want to get to point B, um, we can help you think through right? What are the steps to get along? Okay, so you, first you do some engagement, then you do some uh, brainstorming after you've hear, heard all this stuff. So anyway, we can set, we can help to set up a process that'll move you. So it's not just airing grievances or just, I mean, there's a space for that too, but, um, you know, but not everybody in every space, whether it's government or otherwise, it thinks in terms of process. How, how does this step go to the next step, go to the next step, go to the outcome that you're looking for so that's something that a CED professional brings to this to this to these conversations and and within within our team um one of the things that i uh uh sort of focus upon in that and on this issue is helping the organizations or, or the group of people associations to come together how to formally structure that so that it can survive um one personalities <laughs> uh, in terms of group dynamics um, and then also to to be able to have that formality that they that they can then also sort of pull in the necessary resources, be it financial or materials, things of that nature, to have some sustainability as well. Um, uh, because the issues aren't they they didn't develop overnight and they're not going to be solved overnight. So you do need to have some of that uh, sustainability in there as well. And um, you know, and that goes also into what Eric does in terms of the uh, resiliency piece, but um, I, I think that that's where extension can uh, can can help uh, uh, Crystal. Uh, you know, to your question there. Well, any other questions? Uh, any comments you guys want to share? Anything else? I know we've already gone over our time, but it feels like family. What, what's the clock, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we were just getting warmed up too. <laughs> um, no, I'm just glad that we were able to just share once again. And um, I really love our CD Office Hour Live platform um, because we talk about all different subjects. Um, next week, we get to take a deep dive with Ampros. And um, Next month, we'll, we'll be shifting gears a little bit, and I will be bringing some people on um, on different aspects of small business development, um, And but we're going to talk about it from different perspectives, right? So I have a millennial coming on. We're talking about branding. We're talking about um, organizational resiliency and business growth, even during a pandemic. Um, We'll be talking about the Bureau of Workmen's Comp. We'll be talking about business, free business resources um, and just um, and the Small Business Administration will be coming as well. So I look forward to having those um, facilitating those discussions next month. But um, overall, just thank you for joining us today. And I think we had another good hour of fruitful and authentic conversation. Here I'm just talking with my my uh, microphone muted, but absolutely. So I appreciate you all for allowing me again, third time in a row, to uh, be able to to host such a, a wonderful team. And thank you all again, and you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank time. you, James.